Welcome everyone to this uh, scientific visualization interest group talk. Um, I would say that it's uh, Janelia, but it's nice to see we have people from the Allen Institute, from uh, Europe, from Harvard, from Flatiron Institute, as far as I can tell. Um, and sorry if I'm missing other people, but uh, it's good to see kind of a lot of extramural participa participation. Um, I think we had talked amongst ourselves uh, earlier that it would be great if we had kind of like a Zoom international kind of community where people can come together and talk about scientific visualization in general. Um, but today I think we have, uh, you know, it's, it's really great to, to have John Stone here. Uh, so I, I'm been familiar with his work because he's done a lot of really cool things, including he wrote a chapter in scientific visualization in the Ray Tracing Gems book. He's been uh, working in this field for a long, long time and doing amazing work. He's uh, the lead developer of VMD, which is um, he'll, he'll be talking about uh, during this talk. Uh, and so rather than uh, discuss his pretty extraordinary background in, in history, I'll just turn it over to him and he can start. Okay. Good morning, everybody, or, or uh, lunchtime for some, I guess. I'll go ahead and uh, see if I can get PowerPoint to begin here. Always fun. There we go. Everybody see that okay? So um, as uh, Bill said, um, my main role at University of Illinois is to be the lead developer of a tool called Visual Molecular Dynamics, or VMD. And it's a, a tool that's used to prepare, visualize, and analyze uh, molecular dynamic simulations. And it works with a wide diversity of different simulation packages and different file formats and um, supports some unusual things such as uh, cell scale models that are represented by uh, lattices and a variety of other um, data types that are maybe atypical for most molecular visualization programs. Our topic today is really about uh, using advanced rendering methods to help scientific insight. So rather than tell you all about VMD, I'll just touch on you know, how the needs of molecular science uh, brought us in this direction. Uh, so one way to think about what people are doing with computer simulations of these uh, biomolecular systems is to give them access to spatial and temporal time scales that are not uh, currently accessible by experimental means, by experimental imaging and and uh, and or on uh, to access time scales that we have a recording. And um, to achieve that, we we combine uh, massive supercomputer simulations uh, or la large numbers of independently running. Uh, sampling simulations with uh, the visualization and analysis tools that we develop, and then we can uh, give the scientists access to see this kind of uh, spatio-temporal scales that wouldn't otherwise be available. And th these basically enlighten them about the mechanisms, you know, the uh, that actually underpin uh, the biology that they're trying to study. And so, as you look at uh, systems like um, on the left, we have the ribosome, which is many people will know is uh, an important target for antibiotics, uh, viruses, uh, and is, is another simple example. As we get to systems of the scale that are not just one protein, the structures become incredibly complicated, and we need as much help as we can give the scientist uh, to help uh, them understand the three-dimensional structures and their interactions. And, and the way that different pieces fit together, these mechanical aspects uh, are very important for the molecular scientists. So in addition to the concept of using the uh, sophisticated lighting and rendering techniques, there's another element to what I'll talk about, which is uh, the, the actual algorithm uh, that we're using for a lot of this. And in this case, uh, what I'm going to talk about almost exclusively today is ray tracing. And so many of you have heard of uh, rasterization. That's what uh, OpenGL or Vulkan or the um, Apple's uh, Metal APIs provide by and large. Uh, today, we've seen a transition from rasterization-based approaches to ray tracing-based approaches. And some of the key things that are different, you know, when you, when you rasterize an image, you're taking uh, geometric primitives like triangles, 
and you're sending them through a, a pipeline and you're doing various shading operations on them and they uh, go to a, a frame buffer ultimately and you record things like Z depth and colors and, and things like this. And re rasterization was very practical uh, from the, you know, from the late eighties and early nineties, all the way up until just now, in part because it was very resource efficient. It didn't require very much memory to do rasterization. And so that made it one of the earliest techniques that we could accelerate in hardware. Uh, it meant that back in the days, uh, say in the mid nineties, when memory was a very uh, constrained resource, we could build hardware accelerated uh, machines that had uh, say 96 megabytes of memory. Uh, that would, you know, for a $100,000 uh, uh, graphics accelerator, that was something that became possible. And uh, th that meant that we could attach an accelerator like that to a big workstation. And you could render scenes that were much larger than that in terms of the geometric complexity, but the amount of hardware that you had was sort of fixed at this uh, uh, level that was actually practical. And so that's one of the things that led rasterization to be very successful. Ray tracing by comparison, the nature of the, the algorithm requires that you store the entire scene at once. That means you can't, you cannot just produce it on the fly or have an ephemeral uh, collection of triangles or other primitives flying through a system and, and splatting into a frame buffer. In this case, we're actually going to create a complete model of whatever it is we're going to render. And it has to be stored in memory at once. And it has to be able to be randomly accessed. And that's a very different uh, technical requirement. And so that meant that ray tracing outside of uh, specialty uses didn't really get a lot of use in scientific visualization for a long time. The memory requirements were, uh, you might say, an impediment to its, uh, its progress. Another aspect was we didn't really have hardware acceleration for ray tracing until very recently. So there were, there were various ways of making the algorithm faster but uh, we had nothing like the kind of acceleration we had uh, for rasterization in GPUs. So ray tracing as an algorithm is just now, I would say, entering its heyday. And we're now getting the same kind of uh, focus and attention on making it fast. And that means that uh, with it becoming faster and, and with the memory capacity issues not being as big of an impediment today, there are now a much wider range of application domains that can use it. And, and even in scientific visualization where we often have very large data sets. So uh, some of the things that are interesting about ray tracing, it is uh, you know, an inherently parallel algorithm. There's a tremendous amount of parallelism in ray tracing. So that meant that in, in the old days, we could have run a parallel renderer on a cluster or something like this. And today we can exploit that same parallelism to run uh, high performance ray tracing uh, renderings on a single GPU with thousands, tens of thousands of threads. And um, another thing that's interesting about ray tracing is that uh, it is an, a very easy uh, algorithm to adapt to a variety of purposes. It's, it's an interesting thing. If you look at what it takes, the effort required to implement advanced lighting and shading algorithms within a rasterization pipeline, it's very difficult. Uh, there are huge teams of developers that do this for uh, real-time video games, uh, but the technical sophistication to overcome uh, various limitations or barriers in the way that uh, rasterization pipelines are architected makes it very difficult. So even things like ambient occlusion lighting uh, are very hard to implement with good performance in a rasterizer. And uh, whereas in a ray tracing algorithm, these things are very easy to express. It's sort of the flip side. Uh, we have an, uh, it's very easy to change the rest, the ray tracing algorithm to encompass a, a wide range of uh, lighting and shading techniques. Uh, because it's based on stochastic sampling. And that means that we have all kinds of schemes that we can use to implement those things. The hard part about ray tracing is taking what would normally be a quadratic time algorithm and making it something that runs in linear logarithmic time by virtue of advanced data structures, uh, so-called acceleration structures. Uh, 
and through the use of things like the hardware acceleration. Some of the things that we can do in a ray tracer that are easy, for example, are to do panoramic displays or omnidirectional projections. Uh, rasterizers will just generate a camera model of a, a flat planar image. A ray tracer is not bound by those same requirements. We can do all kinds of things uh, with a ray tracer. So um, in the context of then, you know, where are these, where did these get used first? You know, ray tracers probably found their greatest use in, you know, making renderings of so-called so photorealistic rendering more like what you'd see in Hollywood. This is a, just a little example scene that I rendered with one of my ray tracing engines on a GPU. It's the same ray tracing engine that I'd use for scientific visualization. But just to give you an example, a lot of the work that motivated uh, realistic lighting and shading models was originally intended uh, to render photo, photorealistic scenes. Now, one might ask, well, what's the point of using those photorealistic methods uh, or more advanced lighting and shading models in the context of scientific visualization. And what I, my answer is, uh, people ask me this all the time, why do we want high fidelity rendering techniques in scientific visualization? My answer is always the same. It's basically to give you the same visual intuition in the scientific visualization case that you, you exploit all day long, every day. You've been, you know, knowingly or not, you have been trained your entire life turn to interpret the lighting and shadows and specular reflections of all the objects around you it doesn't really i mean it, it's it's a you know a good question people ask me well, why why do we care about lighting on a virus the virus particle is smaller than the wavelength of light uh, that doesn't make sense to me i said well that's true but what we're what we're really after is not actual photorealism what we're after is is efficient communication so just as an example uh, these are two images of exactly the same geometry. Uh, it's a, a small satellite tobacco mosaic virus. It's a, about a million atom structure, and we've basically sliced it open in half. And uh, to to basically uh, to to make it a clear example, I've removed all the other and you know auxiliary coloring and things that we would normally use, and just show you the geometry. And with a simple uh, direct lip. Uh, scene without shadows, we see the image on the left. Now, if you look very carefully, you might be able to discern that there is a hemispherical shape there, but it's hard to make out. And whereas if we look on the right, we with ambient occlusion lighting, the shadows and the softer lighting that we get from stochastic sampling of a large number of lighting directions gives us this gradual shading and as we look deeper into the cavities and uh, pockets and pores, we get darker shadows. And so the, those are salient structural features that we want to call to the attention of the person viewing the image. And um, I should point out also that, um, you know, scientists are typically very busy people that don't have a lot of time to fool around. And so they want to get an informative image as rapidly as possible with the least amount of their own time and energy spent. One of the wonderful things about techniques like ambient occlusion lighting, which I'll talk about a lot, is that it is, uh, it is sort of a global property. And so there are really, it can be boiled down to, let's say, three or four parameters in total, which uh, you know, amount to an on-off switch and maybe a, a strength and a maximum occlusion distance and you know, if you want to have color or something like that, but that's about it. And those are global properties and they require very little fiddling on the, on the part of the scientist. And you go from a situation where you get an image like the one on the left to a situation where you get the image like the one on the right. Another thing that's interesting about ambient occlusion lighting is because it is, uh, you know, it's an analogy to having a, an overcast sky is the way to think about it or imagine you're you're in the matrix and there's an infinite space with a, sort of a cloudy diffused light coming from all directions that's essentially what ambient occlusion lighting is emulating uh, from an algorithmic standpoint and so what's interesting is as if you rotate this uh, virus structure uh, around you will get the same quality of lighting no matter how you rotate it it isn't really dependent on the minutiae of the placement of some uh, 
uh, point lights or things like this. So the, the user doesn't have to invest a lot of time and energy manually placing lights, uh, learning how the lights uh, work in the case of area lights. You know, before we had ambient occlusion lighting, another way you could get uh, an outcome like this would be to use what they call an area light, which is a large diffuse emissive uh, surface like a big uh, quadrilateral. And uh, those are, you know, nearly the same cost in terms of the rendering time, but they are worse in terms of uh, the usability of a user. They have to start learning how to do lighting, which makes you an amateur Hollywood producer. That's not really what most scientists want to spend their time on. So we favor algorithms that are much more automatic and that require a very small number of parameters to tune to get a desired outcome. And so this is uh, one such example. So I'm a big fan of ambient occlusion um, for this reason. So now if we apply that technique to uh, a normal you know, type of rendering, uh, we see the satellite tobacco mosaic virus structure you know, with its normal coloring, the RNA is reinserted in the, in the capsid center there. And uh, now you can see with the colors, we have a radial coloring applied on the capsid itself. We have uh, different colors for the two uh, RNA strands. And you can see the ambient occlusion lighting is giving us nice uh, shadows in the deeper uh, pockets and pores. These kinds of things are interesting in the case of uh, molecular visualization because they're, they're potential binding sites or they might be a place where uh, ions uh, permeate through a capsid or something like that. I'll show you some examples later on that uh, exemplify more of that sort of thing. <clears throat> Another thing we often do to enhance our perception of depth, uh, if we don't have, you know, stereo glasses were something that was very popular with molecular visualization, and in particular with X-ray crystallography. This is something that in these domains, we've used stereoscopic rendering for decades. Um, and I actually got to meet the son of the inventor of the, the polarized stereo glasses that were used for all these years. Anyway, uh, these things allow us to look at close-up structures like the one on the left. And because you're looking typically in a, per, a perspective projection and you're looking at something uh, close to the camera, that stereoscopic image can give you a much greater perception of the spatial relationship between the different things that are shown in the scene. In molecular vision visualization, uh, people for decades have used um, the special uh, mirror glasses or uh, uh, glasses that uh, can be held up to a manuscript and you can basically see cross-eyed stereo either through those or by just looking at the page yourself and crossing your own eyes and they have done this as a means of doing stereoscopic rendering even for figures that are published in a journal and so that's been going on for a really long time when stereoscopic hardware became available uh, for workstations then people began using this uh, broadly Unfortunately, as I'm sure all of you are aware, uh, with the demise of 3D TVs, now we don't really have uh, that kind of stereoscopic hardware readily available anymore. And it's a really unfortunate thing because, uh, as all of you, I'm sure, know, scientists like to have meetings. You want to have a conversation and a, a large format projector or a television in a room can be a tremendously useful way to have a, a use. A, a discussion about some three-dimensional structure you want to view. And so, uh, for example, our lab was lucky enough to purchase a bunch of stereoscopic TVs back when they were still made. Uh, they're passive stereo and just require uh, polarized uh, glasses to, to look at them. And um, those get used actually quite a lot. Uh, what, what I would say is interesting, though, is people will use the stereo glasses when looking at small structures like you see in crystallography, but if they are looking at large complexes like an entire virus or, or like the COVID-19 variant, something like this, we tend not to see people using stereo because it's, it tends to be a view from farther back. It's more the bird's eye view or the overview rendering of a very large structure. And the stereoscopic rendering in those cases isn't as beneficial. And in fact, a lot of times people would prefer in those cases <clears throat> to use an orthographic projection. And so uh, 
that's an interesting observation too. Um, when we don't have stereo, uh, this image on the left, one of the things that people will do is use fog. So this is not in any way, uh, again, we're not necessarily after photorealism. What we're really after is communicating this uh, spatial relationships. And so if we apply a fog effect, uh, as well as the ambient occlusion lighting. Now we have an enhanced depth perception because as things go deeper into the scene, you can see they're being washed out. So we can do that. It can be depth cueing be, can be something that darkens as it goes in or it can uh, blend to the background color, whatever that is. So in this case, the figure had a, a white background, so we're blending it into uh, the page, so to speak. So this is more like what you'd see in a manuscript figure. I would say, you know, these techniques, we, you know, the greatest challenge in many cases is really making a still image for a manuscript. That's where you have uh, sort of everything is against you, right? You don't have any motion. You have to, if you're going to show uh, temporal changes in structure, you end up having to show maybe a few panels of images. <clears throat> and, um, Without that motion, it's diff it's difficult to uh, ascertain certain parts of the structure, and so you you know this is where the use of depth cueing or stereo or the other techniques, in addition to the advanced lighting, starts to help a lot. Any questions so far? All right, I'll continue. I, actually, John, oh, I had a yeah, question, and, sure. and I, I, you might leave this to the end if you want. Sure. You said that you're a big fan of ambient occlusion. Yes. What do you think of screen space ambient occlusion as an approximation that maybe scales to larger data sets better? So screen space and ambient occlusion is, you know, it has value. It, it, it's a, an inexpensive way of emulating the same effect. So what it's doing, it's basically a post-processing technique, right? You're using the color buffer and the depth buffer together to take an image that you have already rendered and then apply a darkening uh, to the regions where there, where you know the light couldn't have reached. And there are some, you know, there are a bunch of analy analytical schemes to do this. And uh, there's a range in performance. The thing that I didn't like about screen space ambient occlusion is that it is very view dependent. So one of the problems you have is uh, if something is off the screen, it doesn't have any impact on what you see. And, uh, and so then the corollary to that is when something enters the screen from the side or, or the, the user starts rotating the view, um, as something enters or leaves the screen, it can have a dramatic effect and create a discontinuity in, in the way that shading is being done. And I found that uh, at least in our our user community, that wasn't something that people were very uh, fond of. And so just sticking with the, the pure ray traced approach, which is self-consistent under all these different conditions, uh, works out better. So when you're making things like movies, it's, it's a lot for, you know, it's already a lot for a scientist to plan the movie that they're trying to make. But if the rendering system starts to make it more difficult by creating unexpected shadows or things that sort of weren't part of their mental uh, plan or their so-called storyboard, that can be a, a problem. I will say though, that that, you know, there's no free lunch when you start doing things with shadows and, and so on, or you have compl uh, complex lighting, some of those problems are going to arise anyway. So it's just a, a matter of degree is what I'll, I'll say. So I think SSAO is a tremendously practical way to get many of the key benefits at very low cost. And the beautiful thing is it's not very invasive uh, to the rest of the, the application. So for those people that have an existing OpenGL code, uh, screen space ambient occlusion is something that you can basically bolt on after the fact with a, a minor amount of work and, and you will get a big benefit. And I think if you're uh, certainly for a still image, uh, no question, I would use it. If, if you don't have the alternative, then absolutely. I think that's a fine idea. Where I, uh, the only issue is, as I said, when you get into animations or movies or interactivity, especially with a large scene that has many components that may be out of the field of view, that's the, the gotcha I would watch out for. Any other questions? <laughs> 
Okay. So um, one of the things that's beneficial about ray tracing, aside from its flexibility in terms of the way lighting calculations are done, uh, ray tracing is very well suited to uh, doing curved geometric primitives. So that means we can do uh, renderings of spheres, cones, cylinders, various types of tube extrusions, uh, toroidal patches. These are all things. It's just a matter of doing some sophisticated math to do uh, ray geometry intersections. And so uh, we can do that for a wide variety of different types of surfaces. And the cost of doing these things, especially on modern hardware, you know, in the old days, we would count flops and we'd be very concerned with how many flops these uh, complex surfaces take. Today, we have massively parallel GPUs and, and the, the problem is no match for the amount of flops that a GPU has, even if the GPU is doing this stuff in software. Just to give you an example, a state-of-the-art GPU can do about 60 to 120 floating point operations in the same time it takes to fetch one operand from memory. <laughs> so the floating point cost is, is of no concern anymore. The only thing we care about now is memory. So one of the things that's a benefit of using these curved representations is that we can represent a sphere uh, very compactly with just a position and a radius, right? And a color and uh, maybe a material tag, or we can do that for an entire array of spheres. And so we can make these uh, very memory efficient primitives in terms of their storage. Uh, and so that also means that when we do our ray surface inter intersection calculations, that's very low cost. We don't have to fetch a lot of uh, data to do those uh, intersection tests. Compared to rasterization, if we just use triangles, we would need at least a thousand triangles to make a quasi acceptable looking sphere. And even if you use hard advanced hardware accelerated rasterization methods uh, like geometry, shaders and things like this, uh, I think the ray tracer is, is going to outrun them in the majority of cases. And so, especially with the state of the art hardware we have now. Uh, ray tracing, due to the fact that we have to build these so-called acceleration structures that uh, basically subdivide space and help us determine which rays need to be tested against which objects, that is essentially the same as if you had implemented what they, they refer to as occlusion culling in a rasterizer. So any of you who write your own software, if you're using OpenGL or Vulkan, um, occlusion culling is a technique where you, you basically uh, group up a bunch of your geometric uh, primitives. Let's say you've got a big triangle mesh. You group up uh, little subcubes of space and you say, well, there are 10,000 triangles in this little axis aligned bounding box. And so in OpenGL, what you can do is you can draw that bounding box and say, if I drew this box, would it have been uh, visible versus the current Z buffer and color buffer? And, and that becomes a, an all or nothing test. So if even a single pixel of the bounding box could be seen, then you have to draw its contents, right? So the idea then is you sort your scene from front to back and you draw these boxes in, in this uh, sort of reverse painter's algorithm order. And at some point, if you have enough geometry, then the things in the back are occluded. And by doing that occlusion test, drawing that bounding box, the rasterizer can then determine it is able to skip uh, all the contents of that bounding box and there will be no impact on the image. So this is a huge performance gain if, if you imagine drawing things of the complexity of a whole cell, uh, we have a very crowded space with a tremendous amount of geometry. Uh, by doing things with occlusion culling, uh, a rasterizer can be made very uh, much uh, faster, maybe 10, you know, factor of 10 faster in many cases. A ray tracer is going to do that uh, out of the starting gate uh, because you have these acceleration structures uh, are fundamental to making it performant. So you could argue that they're essentially free. And, and I'm going to say that they're free, not because they're totally free, but in the modern context, the uh, acceleration structures are provided by the GPU or, or CPU hardware optimized libraries. So you as a developer, even if you write your own ray tracer, this is not something you have to write anymore. It is now a sort of a, a built-in uh, component of the frameworks that you would use to write a ray tracer today.
some of the other advantages of ray tracing, you know, in a rasterizer, if you want to produce transparent surface renderings that look correct, you have to draw geometry in a, in a correct depth sorted order. Ray tracers process uh, depth sorting intrinsically as they process all the geometry in the scene. Uh, ray, tracer, ray tracers have what they call any hit rays and they do uh, renderings of say transparent surfaces. Uh, ray tracing allows you to do things like physically correct uh, emulations of lenses. So if you want to think uh, effects like depth of field, if you want to draw a viewer's eye to a particular part of a scene, this is an interesting thing. Um, scientists will often, you know, and before we could do this in practice uh, easily in an interactive ray tracer, scientists in our lab would uh, render a scene and then they'd manually blur out the parts that are they, they don't want to draw attention to, or it's, it's only there for context, right? It's to communicate to their audience. They want to show the entire structure, but the other parts are just there to be contextually uh, complete, but they want to draw the uh, reader or viewer's eye to a particular part of the scene. And so things like depth of field are great for that. And uh, the benefit of having it built into the renderer rather than having to have somebody Photoshop it is you've, again, you're, you're using uh, rendering techniques ultimately to help them communicate and to save their time. They don't have to go back and edit these things. I would say uh, these examples like this, uh, I think this is a micelle uh, type structure in the bottom right. This is another case where if you used simpler lighting models, this would look like a flat disc you wouldn't be able to uh, see that there's uh, an octant chopped out of the sphere in the, in the top front side. And uh, similarly, the uh, example above in the top right, uh, you can see the rendering of the spheres and the details of the shading. You know, to me, this structure looks a lot more three-dimensional than the renderings that we are able to produce with uh, conventional uh, direct lighting out of OpenGL. So it makes a big difference, I think, to the, the renderings of those structures. With the amount of memory we save in a ray tracer by representing curved surfaces directly, like the spheres and cylinders and so on, uh, we can very easily render scenes that then have uh, tens or hundreds of millions of geometric primitives. So this is a uh, photosynthetic uh, organelle called a chromatophore. It has uh, 100 million atoms in a conventional simulation. About half of that is water, a little more. And uh, you're looking at the gray and uh, sort of orange uh, spheres and cylinders here are the, the membrane of this uh, vesicle. And uh, the different other parts, the green rings are chlorophylls. So these are something you'll see in a few other example images I render later on. But this is a great example where we had never rendered an image that had this much, this much geometric detail when we started ray tracing these. And we were astounded to find that actually rendering this using ray tracing by virtue of the things I already mentioned, the occlusion culling, the savings in memory by representing things as curved primitives. This actually renders interactively much more quickly in a ray tracer than it does in a raster rasterization pipeline. Now that's with the, the rasterization code that I wrote. So it doesn't have all the bells and whistles. It didn't have things like occlusion culling. Of course, you could make a rasterizer match the performance, but the software effort required is maybe a factor of five over what it is to do the same things in a ray tracing context. So I think that the this when we're starting to render things like this, ray tracing starts to pay off in a big way. Same thing when we start looking at uh, neural network uh, brain models. So this is a structure from the Allen Institute. We're making a, a variation of our software for neuronal network modeling. And this is just a, a large uh, rendering example from one of the early versions of that software. Some of the things we can do that are non-photorealistic, again, you know, for scientific visualization, we're not really after photorealism per se, we're after efficient communication. Uh, one of the things we can do is add uh, effects like outlining edges to highlight different areas of structure. When you, when you have uh, features like edges uh, on, on different parts of the structure, that helps you see what things have a, a front-back relationship to each other. 
they call out different parts of the structure that might otherwise be uh, shaded to, uh, you know, finely to make out. So here we have very moderate amount of shadowing going on. But by adding those outlines, you can see the ridges and the structure that go back quite a ways from the front. So this is akin, again, to the, the schemes we use with depth queuing and other means uh, to basically call out certain structural details. And of course, you can make this uh, stronger or weaker uh, and in combination with things like depth of field. So it's calling your eye to the the part on the left rather than the part on the right, the right starts to become fuzzier and fuzzier. Other things we do uh, with ambient occlusion, <clears throat> as I said at the beginning, the normal ambient occlusion implementation is you have an uh, omnidirectional light, uh, essentially, sort of like on a cloudy day, and we're sampling it in all directions. Well, this works great until you're inside a virus capsid. This is one of these great examples where, uh, we are not really after complete correctness. What we're after is uh, good results or, or, you know, an informative image. And so here we start modifying the model. So instead of going for a completely unoccluded uh, skylit scene, now we're saying that, all right, well, I'm going to reduce the radius of the, the sphere that has to be sampled so that now it can fit within this uh, virus capsid so that I'm no longer concerned about, you know, the, the virus capsid has pores in it. You can see through them, those are these little blue regions, right? So I, if I'm inside the virus capsid, I can see the sky uh, from, from the inside, but there's not enough light to make out any structure. So now I'm going to reduce the sphere and say, well, anything within this maximum occlusion distance, uh, as long as it's not occluded within that sphere, we'll consider it to be lit. This is an interesting scheme, uh, and it has a number of side effects that I, I find interesting. Uh, Willie Riggers wrote a paper, I think it was in uh, PLOS One a few years ago, which was a, a scheme that combined screen space ambient occlusion with a, a user adjustable uh, radius on the occlusion. And this is sort of like that in that by changing the maximum occlusion distance, you end up highlighting uh, structural features at different scales. And so um, with the smallest occlusion distance on the far right, ma smallest maximum occlusion distance, we see only the small cavities and depressions being highlighted with shadows. With a larger occlusion distance towards the left, we see all the, all the structural details, right, are sort of uh, highlighted equally. So this is interesting because it now becomes a knob where you can decide, well, I want to de-emphasize uh, different low frequency undulations in a surface, and I want to emphasize very sharp or high frequency undulations like the ones on the right. So that's an interesting side effect of that uh, technique. You can vary that uh, parameter and get different image outcomes depending on what you're after. In a ray tracer, uh, things like surface peeling are very easy to implement. In a rasterizer, this is very complicated to do for lots of reasons. Um, in a ray tracer, we can actually just simply count how many surface cr crossings a ray has taken as it progresses through the scene. So if I'm doing something like in this example, we have a cryo-electron density map and we've extracted the ISO surfaces and we've made them transparent. Uh, we're using a special transparent material that favors uh, making uh, camera facing surfaces completely transparent and it highlights primarily the edges. And so this gives you sort of an edge outline or a profile of where the surface boundaries are and it's meant to be uh, less uh, complex to look at. It's easier to see what's uh, contained in the interior. But in this particular case, even with all those uh, things being attempted, the structure on the left is so uh, complicated and there are so many other pieces to that density map, it actually serves to occlude what we wanna see on, in the interior. And so by peeling away uh, interior surfaces, uh, now we can remove those occlusions. So that combined with the special material uh, we can see what's inside much more clearly. And if, you know, the goal is, again, communication, 
this is more important to the scientist than it being completely photorealistically correct or you know accurate in that sense it's often useful for us to make more cartoon images or images that simplify these details rather than being uh completely accurate any questions on any of these things so far and of course with is, sorry go ahead bill do you have a question Oh, no, I was just, well, I was going to ask uh, a bit more about the transparent surface peeling sure. approach, the exact uh, thing that you're doing there. Yeah. So uh, the peeling approach is simply as a ray crosses surfaces that it is given a maximum count of how many transparent surfaces it will shade. And once the counter reaches the maximum, it treats any further surfaces as if they're not there. So if you're talking about a modern uh, hardware accelerated ray tracer, they would call the, the rays that are doing uh, this type of shading are called any hit uh, programs. So as the ray hits a surface, it runs in any hit program. That program then uh, checks this counter and says, all right, I've crossed the first surface. I'm gonna decrement that counter by one and, you know, or increment it, whatever your, your preferred scheme is. And basically when you reach your limit criteria, after that, it, any other further hits, it's just going to ignore them and say, I, I am not interested in any further surfaces beyond the first one or beyond the nth one. And so that way, the, the scientist has control over how many of these overlapping surfaces should be visually represented. Um, and it's a very simple, adjustable parameter. So it has a tremendous impact on the outcome of the image. It's very easy for them to adjust there might, you know, there are other ways that a, a person can accomplish this, right? Uh, you could go into a 3D uh, editor and basically crop out parts of your electron density map that are getting in the way. But that's a lot more work than just changing a number, right? If I can just, if I can simply just say, I just don't want to see all that detail. I want to see the outer surface, not a bunch of internal pockets and cavities or or noise. A lot of us have noisy experimental data. This is a very nice clean map. A lot of uh, density maps are very noisy or microscopy images have a high uh, content of noise even after smoothing. And so you might want to simplify what's being rendered for those reasons uh, as well. Thanks, John. And of course you can uh, look at uh, surfaces like these. Uh, this is kind of interesting. They, they chose to make the the lattice uh, out of reflective spheres and cylinders, that in and of itself doesn't accomplish anything. But what I liked in particular was they uh, had, a, this is a finite element model of a, of a, a SARS-CoV-2 uh, reaction transcription uh, complex in the, in, uh, in the center of the uh, cell. And they, uh, rendered this uh, finite element mesh with transparent triangulated surfaces. And so you can see all the interior materials. This is one of those things, if we rendered this with OpenGL this, to get the proper handling of transparency, there would be tremendous amounts of sorting, which would destroy our rendering performance. But we, you know, again, by virtue of the way ray tracing works, doing these traversals in, uh, in order, we get the correct outcome, the correct rendered image, and they can actually do this interactively. And so it's a tremendous alternative way of, of doing these things for structures like this. This is a, a very nice rendering that, you know, to do that in OpenGL would have been very painful. I can't, you know, I, I can say that at least none of the tools I've seen would do a good job with that many overlapping transparent uh, surfaces and things like this. So the stuff I just talked about, as Bill mentioned at the beginning, uh, some of these things you can read about in the Ray Tracing Gems book, which is free. Uh, you can download the PDF of this book at no cost. I think NVIDIA makes it available online. Um, I've got a couple chapters in there on the SciViz topic, as well as on doing uh, planetarium dome master cameras and, and things like this that show some of the uh, non-traditional panoramic type projections that you can create in a ray tracer. Um, so then in, another thing I wanted to get to, uh, we have a little bit of time left. Uh, let me see. 
is uh, talking about things like the the communication of the scene geometry and the impact that has on rendering and IO more generally. And so uh, one of the questions people used to ask me all the time uh, about VMD, VMD has had ray tracing engines built in uh, since long before they were interactive. So they were originally CPU based ray tracers and they would uh, you know, maybe take a minute to render a frame even with multi-core CPUs and, and the like. And so people would ask me, well, what's the point of building the rendering engine into VMD? Why don't you just use Blender or some other tool? And the, the short answer is um, by keeping the rendering in the scientific visualization tool, you're able to exploit a lot of economies in the data representation that you lose as soon as you go into a generic 3D uh, geometry or scene file format, or at least in the case of molecular scenes, this is certainly the case. It could be if, uh, if your geometry is composed only of triangles, well, then life is pretty good. And actually you have a lot of good choices available to you, uh, especially today with things like GLTF and, and so on. But if you render a lot of curved primitives like we do in molecular scenes, then uh, that becomes an issue because a lot of the file formats don't represent things natively with curved primitives. So we again, end up having to tessellate things with triangles. And so that causes your scene size to balloon to 10 to 20 or more times larger than it needs to be. Uh, and doing that and then writing it to disk can actually, it can take longer to write the scene to disk than it does to actually just render it in situ out of the, uh, the host memory. Um, if you're linking your rendering engine in with your SciViz tool, if your SciViz tool uses uh, very sophisticated means of representing these data, uh, let's say you use quantized or compressed representations uh, for surface normals or things like this, these are opportunities that again, most of the scene file formats don't have a way to exploit. But if you write the, the rendering code together with the visualization application, there are often opportunities to directly use those quantized or compressed representations. And so uh, in our case, in VMD, there are a bunch of cases where I get factors of three or factors of 10 reduction in memory size and, uh, by doing the rendering in the program itself and, and retaining these quantized and compressed representations of data. One of the things we also have now, uh, so going from historic to more state of the art, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we now have uh, hardware accelerated ray tracing uh, in state of the art GPUs from NVIDIA, AMD, and I am, I am expecting that Intel's new GPUs will have some uh, capabilities there as well. And uh, these ray tracing acceleration features, uh, people might say, well, what's it good for? Uh, well, <laughs> for some of these scenes, like I'm showing, you can get a factor of eight speed up. So that means that if I use, these are two GPUs that are roughly comparable uh, in terms of their floating point performance. This is the uh, Volta generation uh, Quadro card made by NVIDIA and the, the uh, later Turing R, uh, based Quadro RTX 6000, uh, both using optics. The first one is doing purely software-based ray tracing. The second one is using RTX hardware acceleration. And uh, you'll see that this, the scene on the left is largely composed of uh, triangle meshes. That's a bunch of isosurfaces of these uh, photosynthetic organelle. And, and the one on the right, we have a mixture of different geometry. Both of them are very complicated scenes. There's a lot of transparent surfaces. What you're getting out of the RTX acceleration are two main things in the case of NVIDIA's hardware. You're getting a ray bounding volume hierarchy acceleration structure traversal. Uh, there's a hardware unit that's doing that and it's accelerating that traversal. And the other thing you get is a ray triangle intersection done in hardware. So any, any scenes that have a significant component of triangle meshes will be made uh, quite a bit faster by virtue of the ray triangle intersection. And so these scenes both have some uh, fraction of both of those things. And so I would say 
they represent uh, somewhere near the upper bound. So you can get as much as a factor of eight performance. Now, these were batch mode renderings, so they weren't wasting any time drawing things to the screen or stuff like that. If you're doing an interactive ray tracer, you won't see a speed up of eight. You might speed, see a speed up of more like five, I would say. That's a more reasonable uh, expectation. So again, th this is basically what we're getting out of the hardware. It looks, you know, in terms of the way a ray tracer is written, what that really means inside of the ray tracer is you have a bifurcation of uh, code paths. You handle the triangles in a, in a slightly different way than the way you handle all your other curved geometric primitives like spheres and, and cones and so on. Uh, but they basically run uh, together at once. Um, because we're, again, we're able to exploit things like uh, compressed representations. One of the things we do in VMD with the ray tracing engines that I wrote is we use compressed surface normal. So we take what would have been three floats for uh, surface normal, and we represent those three floats with a single 32-bit integer representation. And those are actually decoded on the fly. And the cost of that is almost negligible. It's, it's basically free because this is only, we only need those surface normals when we're actually shading things. And that's the last thing that happens with the ray tracer. We do the ray surface intersection tests. That's where the bulk of the work goes and, and that and doing lighting tests. And things like shading are done very efficiently and, and only when we know that something is visible. And so we can afford to do quite a bit with sophisticated uh, compression schemes, and it has almost no impact on performance at all, but it saves a lot of memory. So it's in saving memory and then saving memory bandwidth are both uh, beneficial. So as an example, in a run of the mill scene in, in VMD, uh, with a typical mixture of spheres and triangles and so on, we can get about 3 billion rays per second for ambient occlusion lighting with depth queuing and various other things turned on. The hardware peak is somewhere around 9 or 10 billion rays per second with the current hardware. I think the number is similar for both Turing and Ampere GPUs. The difference is there are more cases where Ampere achieves that peak performance it's um, the hardware is more flexible it does a better job of of running your code you might say is my understanding and so we can use that then to render huge scenes we actually did a planetarium dome show uh, that involved this photosynthetic organelles and large numbers of them and uh, this for this work over several years we used a whole bunch of gpus and uh, we did them all with software-based rendering on the GPUs for the production. Today, if we did the same thing, <laughs> it would run 15 times faster. So stuff that was at that time, a uh, one second per frame interactivity experience is now 15 frames per second. And, you know, so it's crossed that interactivity threshold for some of the most difficult parts of that dome show. Another thing that that is uh, interesting to point out is uh, I did a prototype of uh, interactive VR uh, with ray traced ambient occlusion lighting and so on in, in uh, virtual reality HMDs. And to do that in 2016, I had to use a cluster of GPUs. So I actually used on the order of uh, 16 GPUs to be able to do that in real time at uh, acceptable frame rates. And that's rendering a very high resolution stereoscopic pair concurrently on all those GPUs and piping them through a video stream and then decoding that and, and projecting it on a head mounted display. And today you can do the same thing with a single GPU, uh, just you, any of these gaming GPUs. So we're, we're rapidly running into new territory where that none of us have really uh, explored yet. So I'm, absolutely expecting ray tracing to be, begin becoming very practical for VR headsets in the next five years, especially if the hardware acceleration keeps going the way it has been. And so this allows us <clears throat> in the last two years, as you can imagine, our lab and many others have been working on uh, SARS-CoV-2 simulations. This also means we can use these same acceleration features to interactively render
massive uh, complexes like the COVID-19 virus capsids and, and different uh, membranes and spike proteins and so on. This is one done by my lab at Illinois. This is one that we uh, got from uh, Romy Amaro's group at UCSD uh, by Lo uh, Lorenzo Casolino using VMD. So these are all done with the ray tracers. Uh, Lorenzo uses the VMD interactive ray tracer to produce most of his materials. He has some amazing movies if you guys haven't seen them before. And also the, the full aerosolized variant. And so these are all things that you can do now with the hardware that's available. There are Today we have GPUs that have up to 48 gigabytes of memory, and that's enough to load very, very large systems with hundreds of millions of uh, atoms in the case of VMD. If you put that into some other domain perspective, that would be a tremendous amount of other types of geometry, uh, whether it's CFD simulations or uh, microscopy images of various kinds and so on. Another thing that's interesting about ray tracing that I should point out for interactivity, especially with very large structures, it's a stochastic sampling technique. And, and so one thing that's different about ray tracing from rasterization is in OpenGL, when we draw a scene, we have to draw those uh, polygons and rasterize all those triangles completely. They, they will not come back until they have completed the rasterization of every pixel that we told it to draw. One of the things that's interesting with a stochastic sampling approach is we have the freedom to sample it as coarsely or finely as we want. And that means that we can even render scenes with less than one sample per pixel. And uh, one of the schemes to uh, exploit that is then to use what they call AI denoising, which then analyzes the image and basically removes all the speckles so you can actually have an image that has fewer than one ray traced sample per pixel. It's a kind of a bizarre concept, but it gives you then interactivity that might not be achievable uh, by other, any other technique. So that's a really interesting combination. Uh, and of course, even without, or even without AI denoising, you can see that there's then a very simple, what you see is what you get kind of relationship between rendering time and the outcome. And, if you have an interactive progressive refinement ray tracer, the user can see the image converge while they're watching. And they can just press a key, to, you know, when it's at a quality level that they're happy with, it's very easy to use then. This is a lot easier than say the old days where an image might take a minute or an hour to render uh, in a non-interactive way. So that interactivity is a very powerful part of what we can do now. Um, I think I'll ask, I'll let people ask questions and then we'll see where we're at here. Any questions so far? I, I think that uh, we have about, uh, we've reached the, the normal end, but we're going to progress here uh, from this, how, however long you want to take, John. Sure. Um, and, uh, but if you do have questions, if you're about to leave, uh, you can ask them now. And then if not, we'll continue on and then ask the questions at the end. Actually, I had a question. Um, sure. I was wondering what you thought about the state of uh, browser-based systems that uh, have the kind of features you're talking about here. I, I know so, that, uh, Danelia, yeah. people are very fond of Neuroglancer. I'm not sure if you're, if you're familiar with that system from the Connectomics group at Google, which is which is rasterized, but it very good at uh, using uh, multi-resolution chunked data sources mm -hmm. um, to, and that you can get from S3 buckets and so forth. So it's, it's uh, very high performance, very easy to share things. And I was wondering about advanced uh, illumination techniques and systems like that. So the, I would say the big kicker on the web-based tools has been the limitation in terms of what the shading languages allow. So right today, we're currently kind of uh, boxed in in terms of needing to do it within the concept of a, a rasterization-based framework. So we don't yet have the choice of doing these things with full ray tracing. Uh, at present, the ray tracing APIs exist on all the platforms. You can even do ray tracing on a phone today. But the ray tracing extensions to Vulkan and OpenGL and the other APIs haven't made it into the web 
uh, WebGL and things like this. And so I expect that will happen, but we're not there yet. I would say, you know, from what you were saying about grabbing chunked data, those things are just as important for a ray tracer as they would be in a raster, rasterization uh, context. One of the interesting things about uh, the ray tracing uh, scenario, this is an area where there's ongoing evolution. So for example, Vulkan, as far as I know, Vul neither Vulkan nor uh, DirectX ray tracing have support for out of core, uh, which is so-called dynamic loading of things that as you go while you're rendering, you could be paging in textures. This is, this is something that as you can imagine, it's the whole ball game. If you're doing a Hollywood style rendering the, the old, you know, it's kind of funny. The, the old saying was 25 years ago that it took an hour to render a frame in a Hollywood movie. And, and what's funny is today that's, that saying is still true. It's at least an hour now, maybe it's two hours, but what's different is the number of gigabytes of data that go into that one frame They've they have always been rendering uh, geometry and, and texture maps and things that were so big, they were beyond the physical capacity of the machines they were using to do the rendering. And so that has made it into state of the art GPU rendering toolkits. So things like optics have optics has mechanisms for doing out of core paging of textures, things like this. I am very curious to see when that gets into OpenGL or Vulkan extensions. DirectX, and especially for the web-based stuff, that would, to me, seem to be very important because of the, you know, despite the fact that Chrome often uses as much memory as my ray tracer does, I think that, you know, that's, uh, it is, in, at least conceptually, a more limited execution environment. Another thing that I think is interesting, I've, I've been seeing a lot of people doing things with WebAssembly and stuff like this, uh, compiling pull up C++ visualization apps and running them wholesale inside of a browser. That's pretty interesting too. I think if that, you know, that is a, a really interesting possibility as a mechanism for taking uh, conventional desktop visualization apps that have a very steep development cost or a, a long development time frame, or it's not easy to adapt those things by a wholesale rewrite, but just, cross compiling those things for execution in a browser seems like a tremendous opportunity to me. I would love to see more of that. I have seen amazing stuff done within the browsers. So I think browser-based deployment is a big deal. I mean, who none of us wants to become an amateur sysadmin and we've all had some ex experience with this, I'm sure during COVID-19 uh, being away from people's IT departments and having to install your own apps and all that stuff. I think that that's given the web-based tools a lot of attention uh, as they rightly deserve. So I would love to see some of these things migrate into the web ecosystem. Any other questions? I think somewhat similar to what uh, you, you were talking about there. Uh, when we started, uh, you were saying the issue with, you know, if you wanted to do ray tracing on a full scene that you might need to have the whole scene in memory. Yeah, uh, especially if you're doing complicated lighting uh, yeah. stuff that's uh, you know uh, you know global illumination style stuff. Um, there have been some efforts in the past to do. I'm thinking about things like gigavoxels or some mm -hmm. of some of the approaches where they essentially stream the data in. It's a relatively smaller scene. How have you seen uh, what what is the state of that kind of stuff? You know. Um... The existing, like I said, the existing APIs that I'm aware of, like optics, the majority of the work for paging so far, or page faulting or dynamic loading that I've seen has been focused on things like texture maps, right? So, uh, but of course, the 3D texture map is a fine way of doing volume, volume rendering. So, or it's the basis for which you can do volume rendering. So for those things, it certainly works pretty well now. There are ways of doing it. And I've seen people doing it. And uh, it does work. In more general terms, there are things afoot that I think are very interesting. One of the things that they've been talking about in the ray tracing side is we build these uh, bounding volume hierarchies, which are these acceleration structures we use to uh, short circuit ray object intersection tests. And akin to that uh, uh, occlusion culling in rasterization, right? Um, 
in the ray tracing pipelines at present, one has a specific bounding volume hierarchy for some group of objects that you've drawn. And that's what you've got. And if you want to change that or, or uh, provide an alternative, uh, you have to kind of rebuild your scene. One of the things that they're talking about is particularly in cases where you have instancing of many of the same things, like you have one of these Lord of the Rings scenes with a billion uh, characters, or if you have a big city, or let's say you're drawing a cell and you want to have uh, thousands of ribosomes, which are maybe not identical, but they're similar. Uh, if you use things like instancing to do those things, you can have level of detail. Level of detail is an unexploited opportunity in ray tracing. And, and it's partially because in the ray tracing case, um, we can use instancing very efficiently. It costs you almost nothing. It's just a geometric transformation and it costs you very little memory. So you can, I don't know if you're aware of this, but you can draw scenes that have billions and billions of objects using instancing in a ray tracer, and it won't really impact the rendering performance nearly as much as if you did similar things in a, in a rasterization pipeline, at least in the ones I've, I'm aware of. And, um, but one of the, de the detractions is we can't easily do level of detail because they, it wasn't uh, a, concer a concern for uh, memory consumption uh, because the, these instances doesn't matter what they contain, the, the cost is fixed. So whether it's a, a model of the entire earth or in your copying whole earths or, your, or it's a single triangle, the, the memory consumption per instance is fixed. So uh, they didn't really do much there, but now they're realizing for really heavily instanced cases, we might wanna have dynamic level of detail where you provide several different representations of the same things. Those are things that are stuff that they're talking about, uh, pulling the, that geometry from disk. If, if you can do it dynamic, if you can start making dynamic decisions about how you're gonna draw something that's contained in a bounding box, then you start to have the possibility of doing page faulting or saying, well, there, that's a Bob proxy box and uh, what's in there and it hasn't been loaded yet. Let me go get it. And so then you can go fetch it, define that geometry on the fly. There's a huge number of opportunities for things like that that are as yet unexploited. Um, anyway. Uh, did you have any slides on the direct IO? Because I'm wondering if that- uh, Yeah, I wanted to, I, yeah. I, I do have some, I wanted to show a couple of things about the performance of IO and how that impacts ray tracing. Everybody will watch, you know, when you see in the media going forward, you'll see lots of, I'm expecting ray tracing benchmarks will be the new thing with all the video games. Uh, so whether you play any video games or not, you'll be able to read about the latest graphics cards and some benchmarks about how they do on some video games. But as you guys know, uh, video games are not scientific visualization. So I, I will get into the, the IO parts here in a second, if, if that's what you guys are ready for. If there's any yeah. last questions before I go on, let's go ahead and do those. And, and then I'll shift to the IO stuff. I think we should, uh, yeah, move on and then. Okay. So, um, yeah. So anyway, the, with time varying, uh, renderings, you know, we can exploit the opportunities to vary number of samples per pixel. There are a bunch of uh, considerations in doing that. Uh, you can go back and check out this slide later if you want to know more. Um, in terms of IO, one of the interesting things you'll learn is that, uh, even for relatively small, uh, scenes, if we want to do time varying geometry, and that's something I care a lot about because in molecular simulations, we want to see the dynamics of these uh, molecules. The dynamics is where a lot of the magic actually happens. And so we want to be able to uh, animate a trajectory. And uh, just as a simple example, I did some benchmarking and my, my benchmark test case was a 1024 squared uh, rendering at 60 frames per second with 16 samples per pixel with both anti-aliasing and ambient occlusion lighting. <clears throat> and what I'm showing is the little pie chart on the right. The, uh, the red is the ray tracing time. So that's how much time is spent rendering. And the blue is the amount of time spent getting the geometry from the host or from somewhere, from wherever it came from onto the GPU and prepared for rendering. So you can see for this simple scene, uh, 
uh, 56% of the runtime is the ray tracing. And, and that's with a lot of, it's quite a few samples. Most, uh, you know, video games and other cases, you wouldn't even bother doing that many samples. So I'm making it work pretty hard on the rendering on purpose. Um, now, if we go to a larger mesh, let's go to a 13 million triangle mesh. Uh, the same thing, uh, everything else ha held constant. Now the ray tracing time only represents 18%. And the rest is moving the data and building the acceleration structure. And uh, this is on a, a host machine that's got PCI Express 3.0. So these are, you know, a, a couple year old machine. And uh, then if we go to a very large case with 156 million triangles, now you can see we're in the regime of one frame per second. And uh, it's completely dominated by the time it takes to copy the triangle mesh from the host to the GPU and to build the acceleration structure. Now, uh, if I compare that, these, these first tests were done on an Intel-based platform that had PCI Express 3. That's a very fast so-called XE CPU that has AVX 512 and all the other bells and whistles. Uh, if we go to a PCI 4 host and change nothing else, then uh, what you see is we get on the large scenes, we get about a 20 to 30% performance increase. That's a nice increase, but it's not nearly what you'd expect because PCI Express 4 is double the bandwidth. So you might ask, well, where's my bandwidth increase? You know, why, why isn't this better than that? And um, the answer is there's an issue with uh, transferring large data on, on any PCI device of any kind. But it's a particular issue for GPUs because they're very fast. And that is called memory pinning. And so if you've never heard of this, this is the, uh, the issue that our computers have so-called virtual memory and the page of memory may or may not be in the system at a given moment in time. And that's how you're able to run more, more stuff than you actually have physical memory uh, capacity for uh, up to a point. Uh, the problem is when you wanna do things like IO, uh, things like disk controllers and GPUs, they, don't, they aren't willing to play that game. That memory actually has to be there. And so one of the issues is then when you're doing a big memory copy, the operating system kernel has to go through every single 4K block of memory, every single once, and these are 4K at a time, and it is going to have to manually pin that page of memory that guarantees it will not be evicted in the middle of your IO. So it's gonna pin them, do some copies, and then unpin them. This is a very expensive operation. And so we actually spend as much time in this operating system overhead as we do in the copies. So what we want to do uh, to get the theory closer to the theoretical peak performance is to prearrange that our entire memory buffer is pinned at the outset for the entire time I have it. So, and, and that can be done in the case of CUDA, there are special memory allocators and the same with OpenGL and Vulkan and, and DirectX. Um, and these basically tell the operating system, hey, this memory, you cannot page it out. It is going to have to stay in physical memory. And uh, that means that when we do things like I.O., it's already known to be there. And the disk controllers and the GPUs can directly copy with no overheads. If we look at a trace of my little test case here, these green circles are areas where we're, we're doing those copies and the the little green circle here is another area where we have overhead to prepare the scene for rendering. All the blue areas that along this top stripe here, that, that's when the GPU is actually pegged doing arithmetic. So when it's blue, life is good. When it's empty or uh, not doing anything of consequence, that's bad. So we want to crush these circled regions to make them smaller uh, so we spend more time doing rendering and less time on disk I.O. So now if we, if we pre-pin our memory buffer, and this is kind of a, a scary way to have to do it. If you're, if you're using C++ with your favorite standard template library constructs, then there's some special magic you can do to tell it to allocate <coughs> your, your vector out of pinned memory. And if you do this, the reward, although it's kind of ugly code, the reward for doing this is a massive speed up. So 
not only do I get a bigger speed up than I got before, but I get a fa another factor of 1.5. So uh, we're basically reaching, you remember my original speed was about one frame per second on PCI3. And having pinned the memory buffer, now I am actually getting two frames per second on PCI4. And this is, uh, again, this is the case where IO, we're spending more time doing IO than we are uh, ray tracing. And it doesn't matter that this, uh, this data came from RAM on the host machine, but it would be just as big of a deal uh, if we were doing stuff from disk. So then uh, the question is, how do I get stuff from storage systems? That's, a, that's another issue, right? I could read the data into the host memory and then copy it to the GPU, but that means I copy it twice. That we don't want to have to do. So I complained about this vociferously for years, and NVIDIA listened to my pleads and, and begging. And eventually we got what is now called GPU direct storage. And it's basically a, an API, uh, which is called CU file which you can see right there. And GPU direct storage is basically a means of doing IO from a file system that's accessible to the host, but it bypasses the CPU completely. So the IO goes straight from the IO device right into the GPU, completely bypassing the CPU. And what that, an interesting side effect of that is if you have a, a state-of-the-art machine that has multiple PCI buses and or uh, PCI Express switches arranged in the right way, uh, you can have a GPU paired with an NVMe controller attached to the same PCI Express switch, uh, which are then attached to the host PCI bus. If these things are attached to the same switch, the GPU and the NVMe controller can communicate without involving the host CPU. And you can have a machine, in this case, I'm talking about a, an NVIDIA DGX2. It actually has uh, an NVMe switch uh, that contains uh, two GPUs per NVMe controller. And then there's NVMe controllers with a bunch of SSDs uh, up to, I think, in the maximum configuration, it's uh, 16. At our lab at Illinois, we have the smaller version of this. Um, but anyway, you can uh, basically have those GPUs talk directly to the SSDs. And so what that means is on a little machine that's, uh, you know, the size of a, a 4U or, or 8U rack mounts, you've got uh, IO rates of 22 gigabytes per second into your GPUs. So that's pretty amazing. That's, now that's coming from uh, internal storage, you know, a little array of SSDs. Um, if you were doing that through the host, and this is using, you know, the fanciest host code that you can write, uh, you can get about 10 gigabytes a second, but doing it through the GPUs, because you have more parallelism, because they can talk directly to their own disk controller NVMEs, uh, bypassing the host, they just have more aggregate bandwidth, so they can go faster. If you, if you wrote this with normal CIO, you know, uh, not, and, and not using massive Unix tricks, the best you can do with the host is about seven gigabytes a second. So really, if you go from any code that most of you have ever seen to what we're able to do here, you get a factor of three. And if you go to something like network attached storage, where you have a, a machine like a DGX2 containing several InfiniBand cards, uh, so you may have up to eight InfiniBand cards. If you link those InfiniBand cards to network attached storage, which might have a, a much larger array of NVMe disks or, or magnetic disks, uh, you can get even higher bandwidth. So the, I have actually written code in, in VMD to do a particular molecular analysis and achieved an aggregate IO rate of 71 gigabytes a second using 16 GPUs and four threads per GPU. So that's pretty amazing. So with that, you know, we have in the molecular modeling case, we want to do a particular calculation for clustering analysis. And for any of you that do clustering analysis on any data, you know that the input for that is a so-called dissimilarity matrix, right? In our case, a dissimilarity matrix, every number in that matrix is a pair of structures. So we're going to calculate something called the root mean squared uh, deviation that compares the similarity of two structures and reduces it to a single scalar value. 
And so to produce this matrix, we're going to do n squared over two uh, trajectory frames. And each frame might be a few megabytes. So you can imagine very quickly here, we're doing terabytes of IO, um, even for very small structures. And so this is a completely IO bound algorithm, uh, even on a CPU, even if forget about GPUs. If I write code, I can write a hand coded vectorized kernel to do the math. And I will make this IO bound even on a, even on a single socket CPU, I can make it IO bound. So the only way to make this kind of analysis faster is to get better IO performance. And so this is where this GPU direct IO has been very interesting to us. And so that, that's one of the applications, but I thought I'd uh, show that to you guys and uh, hope you find that interesting. And then the last thing I was just going to say, I, I know you already had a webinar on it, but uh, you don't have to write a ray tracer from scratch. You can use uh, rendering engines that other people are writing for you. And there's a new chrono standard called Inari that I'm involved with uh, where we're doing this. And uh, there, there are early implementations available on the web right now. You can go download the software and there are implementations for NVIDIA, Intel, and AMD GPUs and CPUs already. And there should be some uh, new open source stuff coming soon as well. And all of those are available at no cost. And I'll take, and so these are just some examples uh, from VMD with early backend renders uh, in Inari, all of them rendered using the same inputs. And then I'll take your questions. Fantastic, uh, John. Thanks so much for going over this material. Uh, yeah, and let's see, do we have any questions? I think- uh, And I'll take any questions at this point, long, short, or otherwise you can, if you want to edit them down ex post facto, that's fine. Right. There, there's a couple of questions that came up on chat and I know Dan, you had one, Pat, you might've had something there feel free to ask. Mine was just a comment, really sort of anticipating the time series slides, just echoing that, yeah, that, that IO bandwidth is a bigger bottleneck than rendering. Yep. For types of scenes, yeah. And I, and I would argue that's, a, that's one reason I'm a big fan of the advanced lighting methods and things like this, because if you're gonna pay the cost for doing all that IO, uh, regardless of how you render it, then you might as well exploit all of the rendering techniques that are available to you to make the image more understandable, whether they're a quasi photorealistic or if they're more cartoonish schemes. These are all opportunities where you can make the, make the rendering engine basically work harder on behalf of the scientist. If you, if you can trade rendering time against the human time, it's a good decision, you know, and clearly so going forward. I think that also uh, relates to, you know, your initial case, John, about talking about compact data structures. Yeah. So whenever you can start representing things that you want to visualize, and, and in your case, it was like these uh, curved surfaces of mm -hmm. various types. I think that what we're looking at too are more like sparse volume data right. structures, um, like the sparse DAGs that they talk about that could actually uh, reference multiple geometry but in different locations, right? That they, they actually have some of these compressed uh, things. Uh -huh. That makes a lot of sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody in the chat asked about how many of the lessons and algorithms were originally developed in Pavre for DOS decades ago. You know, it's an interesting question. I would say uh, Pavre, you know, uh, was used for lots of things, you know, um, I think the thing that was interesting about Pavre was that it was extensible. And, you know, Pavre is the descendant of uh, David Buck's ray tracer. So David K. Buck uh, wrote a, a renderer called DKB Trace that is the, uh, the ancestor of Pavre, actually. And uh, that, too, had a lot of these uh, kinds of features. In our domain, some of the lessons didn't come from Pavre. They came from a tool called Raster 3D. And Raster 3D, as I recall, was actually written in Fortran. And, and it had, as an example, uh, that's where some of the ideas for uh, the transparent surface uh, peeling, that was a, an interesting feature that came in Raster 3D that was sort of 
it was specific for in those days i think people used raster 3d <coughs> quite a bit in the crystallography area and so that was something they needed because you get these cluttered density maps and you know the necessity is the mother of invention so raster 3d had uh, transparent surface peeling and it had uh, some of those special material properties. Pavre didn't have those kinds of things as I that I can remember, but Pavre was very scriptable. So the thing about Pavre was you didn't have to be satisfied by the things that were built into the code. You could write very sophisticated scripts that would then be interpreted at runtime to create all kinds of uh, complex geometry and uh, different complex materials in, in particular. Probably the materials were one of the things where Pavre really uh, covered a lot of ground, um, maybe concurrently with RenderMan and, and Pixar uh, with programmable uh, shading techniques, you know, before we had hardware acceleration of those things. Uh, th thank you so much for uh, this conversation. And um, yeah, we'll definitely have this up on the YouTube for other people to, uh, you know, learn from your observations. And uh, thanks so much. All right. Thank you guys. I enjoyed it. Okay.